One of the most impressive aspects of the original Subnautica is its beautiful and expansive underwater world. Each of Subnautica's biomes, from the claustrophobic depths of the Blood Kelp Zone to the mesmerizing sunlight-filled stretch of the safe shallows, is home to a unique atmosphere full of distinct flora, fauna, and resources. Many devout Subnautica fans, including myself, wish they could wipe Subnautica's biomes from their memory, just so they could experience exploring them for the first time all over again to capture that feeling of sublime wonder. However, for many fans, Subnautica Below Zero failed to recapture this feeling. Don't get me wrong here, some of Subnautica Below Zero's biomes are among the best we've seen throughout both games. The Deep Lilypad's caves and the Fabricator Caverns are genius ideas that were executed extremely well. However, in my opinion, the average quality of Subnautica's biomes is much higher than the average quality of Subnautica Below Zero's biomes. Similarly, Subnautica's peak biome design is also much higher than Subnautica Below Zero's peak biome design, and even the least impactful areas of Subnautica's crater hold more merit than the dull expanses of Sector Zero. The thermal spires, purple vents, and tree spires don't feel distinct enough from each other, which takes away from the experience of swimming into a new area and exploring its unique features. The Arctic Kelp Forest is merely a reskin of the Kelp Forest from Subnautica, without the added element of danger presented by large predators. While the land biomes such as the Glacial Basin and Arctic Spires are very well designed, they don't quite capture the essence of a Subnautica game, and even with the decreased map size, large amounts of space seem to be wasted by the bland, barren Arctic biomes. It feels as though the developers, Unknown Worlds, ran out of ideas for how to fill the remaining space on the map. Which brings me to my main point. Regardless of whether or not you agree with my analysis of Subnautica and Subnautica Below Zero's biomes, it's likely that after two Subnautica games, the developers are running out of alien underwater biome ideas for their upcoming Subnautica 3 game. At the same time, with the general disappointment of Subnautica Below Zero, many fans are looking to Subnautica 3 to either mark the end of the franchise or propel it to new heights. In other words, there's a lot of pressure on the Subnautica team to make Subnautica 3 stand out amongst its predecessors, or possibly even surpass the original title. This means there's also a ton of pressure on them to create some of the best biomes they've ever made. And considering that Subnautica 3 will be developed in Unreal Engine 5, assuming they have the right ideas, Unknown Worlds has more technical potential than ever to introduce some jaw-dropping new biomes to their players. This is where I come in. With some inspiration from the community, I've created four unique biome ideas that I would love to see in Subnautica 3. Whatever approach Unknown Worlds takes to this new Subnautica game, I believe these concepts will fit in just fine. I've also commissioned four unique pieces of concept art to match each of my four biome ideas, which wasn't exactly cheap, so supporting my channel by hitting the subscribe button would be greatly appreciated. But without any further ado, get ready to explore a brand new alien world with your flippers, rebreather, and all environment protection suit as we answer the ultimate question. What will Subnautica 3's biomes look like? My first idea for a Subnautica 3 biome is something I call the Rotnest Biome. Now, it is important for me to mention that the names for the biome concepts discussed in this video are not set in stone, and could be changed by the developers according to their creative interests. Regardless, this biome is based on three pieces of Subnautica Below Zero concept art that ended up being scrapped, but I believe could be adapted into Subnautica 3 as an entire biome. The Rottenest creature is described in the scrapped concept art as a virulent parasite, with a stark similarity to a zombie virus. Its prey would be infected by exploding spore pods which would attack any creature that swam too close to a corpse infected by the rot nest. This would cause the new host to become deranged, attacking nearby animals and releasing spore pods from cysts growing on its flesh. The host would eventually die and its corpse would be digested and used by the rot nest to infect other creatures. The other pieces of concept art dive a little bit further into what the rottenness could have looked like infecting certain creatures, how it could have attacked the player, and how it could have grown its own eye-like structures on its hosts. My concept of this creature and the biome it would inhabit retains some similarities to the original, but also diverges in a few key ways. In fact, I've even taken inspiration for this biome from the single cell biome, which is a very popular piece of concept art from the early days of Subnautica's development. And for those of you who know your Subnautica lore, this also takes a bit of inspiration from Strader 6. The Rotnest biome would be home to a hive mind creature also known as the Rotnest. At some point in time before the Rotnest arrived, this Subnautica biome would have been a normal, boring biome with flora and fauna seen throughout the rest of the world. However, sometime before the events in Subnautica 3, the Rotnest creature would have arrived. Its arrival could have a number of explanations. 
Perhaps it came to the planet through an asteroid from outer space. Perhaps it was introduced from another part of the planet. Or perhaps it was even created artificially by some sentient species. Regardless of its origin, the rottenness would have slowly but steadily taken over the old biome upon its arrival. Very weak without a host, the rottenness would have started the infection as several small free-floating orange polyps, armed with stinging cells capable of injecting parasites into a target's skin. All it would have taken was one touch from another life form, and the infection would have begun. In a matter of hours, the rottenness parasites would have spread throughout the victim's body and across its skin, forming a network of microscopic tendrils that ultimately reached the eyes and brain, weakening the host's eyesight and puppeting it towards new victims. Eventually, the skin would break out in pustules that would release more polyps when nearby other creatures, allowing the life cycle to repeat itself. Through this process, the rottenness would have slowly taken over all the flora and fauna in the old Subnautica biome, turning many into mindless fleshy vehicles for attacking and infecting other life forms. Other organisms would have simply been used as fuel by the rottenness to create its own living structures by rearranging cells through a process known as dedifferentiation. When a cell has a determined purpose, it can only complete that specific function, but by reversing the specialization process, the rottenness would have been able to reconstruct living tissue into new forms. Certain organisms would be turned into twisted, calcified structures that would act as the backbone for other structures, such as fleshy masses designed to store energy or defensive pseudopods designed to protect sensitive areas. These structures would completely cover the ground in areas closer to the center of the biome, but would begin to thin out the further you travel from it. Although the rottenness may appear to be a mere parasite at first, it's important to understand that everything the rottenness infects becomes a part of the rottenness organism. The rottenness is not just a parasite. That's simply a tiny part of the creature with a specialized purpose. Over time, the rottenness transforms into a massive connected life form spread across vast areas of space, with specialized components much like human organs, that perform specialized tasks designed to benefit the collective. In that sense, it really becomes just like any other form of multicellular organism that exists. The only difference is that its method for growth is rather unorthodox. A large central mass of flesh, shaped much like the brittle star creature found within Earth's oceans, would be located at the very center of the biome in the exact spot where the rottenness was first introduced into the environment, and where the very first polyps spread outwards to infect a host. This master colony, as it would be called, would act as the rottenness nexus of information by receiving signals from across the biome and sending signals back through orange vines protected by hardened coral structures that designate responses to threats or what specific creatures should be targeted next for infection. In other words, the master colony would be the rottenness brain and nervous system that would control the actions of every other piece of the rottenness organism. Growth and maintenance of the master colony would require a great amount of energy, which would be provided by infected creatures that would either bring food or sacrifice themselves to sustain the entire colony. Because of this structure's importance to the rest of the rot nest, this area would also be the most heavily protected. Additionally, since the rot nest would be the strongest at this point, its ability to modify its host would also be the greatest. Infected hosts may be signaled to visit the master colony in order to receive biological upgrades, such as extra limbs or added defenses. At some point in the story, the player might be able to destroy the hive mind and stop the infection. This could act as the side story for Subnautica 3, much like repairing the Aurora's drive core in the original Subnautica. The destruction of the rottenness could be accomplished with explosives or maybe some sort of poison. Regardless of how this would be done, it's very safe to say that doing so would be extremely difficult. And once the rottenness was killed, the biome would be left completely dead with nothing inside of it but rotting rottenness flesh, which would be very interesting to see. However, without suitable reason and reward, players would likely avoid the rottenest biome altogether. In order to incentivize players to enter the area and eventually destroy the infection, there would need to be exclusive resources found within the biome. One such resource might need to be collected in order to kill the master colony. Similarly to how antivenoms or vaccines are made, in order to find the rottenest weakness, you would need to collect samples of it in its fleshy and hardened states. From there, you could synthesize some sort of poison or destructive compound with the capability to entirely wipe out the rot nest. After destroying it, the newly exposed ground could contain some kind of precious late game mineral that could be crafted into upgrades. Perhaps even the decaying flesh of the rot nest itself could contain some chemical that could be synthesized into weaponry or medical equipment. And to go a step further, the developers could even incorporate an essential aspect of Subnautica 3's story within the biome to further necessitate the exploration of this very unique area. There would be three main reasons as to why the Rotnest wouldn't have taken over the entire playable area in Subnautica 3. 
Firstly, the biome it would inhabit would be deeper than the surrounding area, like a huge depression or hole in the terrain. This would serve to slow down the rottenness spread. Secondly, the rottenness would be a very defensive creature. Rather than spreading outwards and targeting creatures to infect, it would prioritize fortifying and feeding its current structures, and defending the central hive mind. Infection and expansion would happen at a very slow rate, usually when uninfected creatures would wander into the rottenness biome. Thirdly, the rottenness simply wouldn't have been around long enough to have ample time to infect the entire map. If it had arrived earlier, it's entirely possible that this would have occurred. The central mechanic of exploring this biome would be that being detected by a rottenness infected creature, or bumping into a rottenness infected plant or structure would alert the entire hive mind and trigger an attack. So, in order to explore the biome, the player would have to be incredibly stealthy, perhaps even using specialized equipment to remain undetected. Unlike the infected creatures depicted in the scrapped concept art, the infected creatures inhabiting this biome would be almost entirely blind, and would struggle to detect the player, one of the many symptoms of becoming infected. The player would only be detected upon coming in close contact with infected creatures, as the infected would be able to feel disturbances in the water around them. The player would also be detected upon physically touching any rottenest matter. This is especially dangerous because the player would need to cut the rot nest in order to collect samples of it that would ultimately be used to destroy it. Additionally, the rot nest would construct spiderweb-like structures in an attempt to catch and detect creatures exploring the biome. Rot nest vines would hang down from the caves, and huge tentacles would move around in random directions attempting to make contact with a wandering creature. This biome would essentially be one big death trap, and as you venture closer to the master colony, the density of these trapping appendages would increase. The same goes for the number of infected creatures, making the biome much more dangerous the closer you get to the center. In the event that the player is detected, any rottenest organisms in the area would begin attacking. Organic spears containing polyps would be launched from all sides towards the player, which would have to be avoided at all costs. If a polyp were to ever hit the player, there are two options for what could happen. Either the player would instantly die, or they would become infected and would have to be cured in some way. You wouldn't be granted the same grace as the Kara, however. The infection would be a real threat that would actually kill you rather quickly if not properly dealt with. Thankfully, making a cure for the polyps would be much easier than killing the central hive mind. You would also be able to see other organisms wander into the biome, get attacked, and become infected, which I think would be very cool to observe. You'd even be able to manually bring organisms into the biome to see them get infected. And perhaps, if the option where you could cure yourself was chosen by the developers, you'd also be able to cure rottenness infected creatures, probably only those in the early stages of infection. Regardless, as time goes on, the area and number of organisms infected by the rottenness would slowly but noticeably increase. The color themes for this biome would mostly consist of sickly yellow and orange colors, with maybe a little bit of white mixed in. The biome would be relatively deep and dark. It would be a disgusting, horror-oriented biome, as the player would have to explore stealthily, and alerting the hive mind would trigger what would essentially be a jump scare, with intense music similar to abandoned ship playing the moment you were detected. I think this biome as a concept is incredibly interesting, and I would love it or something like it to appear in Subnautica 3. It's clear that the idea for a living biome that attacks the player has floated around in the developers' minds for quite some time now, so seeing it actually being brought to life would be a dream come true. Beneath the sprawling metropolis of Paris, France lies a labyrinth of tunnels known as the Paris Catacombs. This maze holds the remains of more than 6 million people, as the tunnels were constructed in order to eliminate the city's overflowing cemeteries. For over 200 miles, the hallways of the catacombs twist through the subterranean depths of Paris, sometimes cloaked in total darkness. As a result, it comes as no surprise that a number of people have disappeared in the depths of this underground cemetery, never to be seen again. The Paris Catacombs serve as the inspiration for this biome's name, but the actual idea for this biome comes from a video I made many months ago, discussing my ideas for a Subnautica 3 game. Not only is that video my favorite video on this channel, but you guys seem to absolutely love it as well, so I would highly recommend giving that video a watch after finishing this one. Anyways, this biome is based on the environment from the Subnautica Crush Depth concept that was discussed in that video. The catacombs biome would consist of a huge deep sea cave system, although its size could vary depending on the developer's wishes. There could be several entrances to the biome or there could be just one. And much like the previous biome concept, this biome would be horror oriented. Don't worry though, I do have some non-horror ideas for all of you scaredy cats out there. The tunnels and caverns of the catacombs would vary in size from being only a few centimeters wide to being several cyclopses wide. 
While the smallest tunnels would be inaccessible to the player, they might offer the player a sneak peek of other areas of the catacombs, which would have to be accessed through other routes. The caves would be rather dark, with minimal lighting coming from bioluminescent fauna and flora growing on the walls of the caverns. Certain regions would be more lit up than others, hinting to the player that they might be areas of interest. The caves would twist, turn, and double back on themselves, making it very easy to become disoriented and lost while exploring. To account for this, specialized technology could be constructed to assist the player in navigating the maze of the catacombs. Due to the absence of sunlight, the unique deep sea fauna that would inhabit these caves would have to rely on volcanic activity to obtain energy. There is a lot of potential for unknown worlds to take inspiration from real world deep sea organisms and adapt them into some incredible new ideas. And Unreal Engine 5 would only serve to make these ideas even better. Thermal vents would give rise to abundant colonies of heat-resistant animals that would feed on chemosynthetic bacteria. From these vents, creatures would be able to spread out and live across the caverns, creating a diverse ecosystem of beautiful wonders and ferocious beasts. Deep Sea Gigantism, which is the tendency for species of deep sea dwelling animals to be larger than their shallow water relatives, would also take place resulting in some huge, breathtaking yet absolutely terrifying life forms that I would absolutely love unknown worlds to take a shot at. Most of these creatures would be carnivorous and would need to be avoided. The largest carnivore would be a close relative of the gargantuan leviathan and could be found slithering through the deepest, darkest sections of the catacombs. By rubbing its huge body against the sides of the tunnels, this creature could sense vibrations from anywhere in the biome. This might seem preposterous, but it's actually quite possible. On Earth, fish sense changes in the water around them, such as pressure drops or vibrations through an organ called a lateral line. Have you ever tested the direction of the wind by sticking out a wet finger? That's basically what fish do constantly. A creature like this one with a very long body in a large surface area would have a highly sensitive lateral line. But how would the vibrations travel through the rock? Well, the catacombs would be in an area with a lot of volcanic activity, so the rock in the area would likely be low-density igneous rock, like granite, pumice, or obsidian, allowing vibrations to travel through easily. As a result, the Leviathan would be able to feel out even the slightest of movements, which is how it would find prey in the labyrinth that is its home. Due to its tracking capabilities, the player would have to be on constant alert to avoid it. In order to survive its assault, the player would have to duck into smaller crevices of the catacombs to escape its bite, which would instantly kill the player. Just imagine exploring a maze of underwater caves, when suddenly the walls begin to vibrate, a roar echoes in the distance, and then suddenly a massive creature blindsides you from behind and swallows you whole. It kind of reminds me of the ice room from Subnautica Below Zero, but it would honestly be way more terrifying. Anyways, due to this cat and mouse game, I've decided to call this creature the Seeker Leviathan. Physically, it would share a striking similarity to moray eels, complete with a protruding inner jaw. Besides the Seeker Leviathan, I would also imagine much smaller species living in the tiny sub-passages branching out from the bigger corridors that would reach out and attack the player if they swam too close. This would be the primary characteristic of this biome, the ability to be jump-scared. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to explore the catacombs without being jump-scared multiple times, because even though some caverns would be considerably wide, they would still contain little offshoot caves and rocks that creatures would use to hide. Perhaps, in an effort to evade the Seeker, you might travel into the territory of less dangerous but still aggressive carnivores, which, much like Subnautica's crab snakes, want you out of their home. The flora inside the caves would be more focused on deep-sea beauty and bioluminescence, but there could be carnivorous plants as well. Perhaps some plants would sit and wait, growing out from the cave walls, and would clamp shut around the player when they ventured too close, similar to the spiky trap from Subnautica Below Zero. I would also imagine flora similar to the drooping stinger which would simply hang from the ceiling of the caverns and wait for the player to run into them. Of course, these creatures would be very different in design and implementation than the established life forms they are based on. Among the dark, confusing halls of the catacombs, some areas would offer a respite to the player. Much like the giant cove tree in Subnautica, these small caverns would be safe and mystifying. Based on their size relative to the enormous catacombs, they would basically be easter eggs for players dedicated enough to explore the area. The possibilities for what these easter eggs could be are practically endless. They could contain rare flora and fauna, such as species too frail to survive in the path of the seeker. They could contain mini biomes full of luminous crystals, or pieces of coral so grand and intricate you'd think they were sculpted. It's entirely up to Unknown Worlds' imagination. Among my sea of ideas, one stuck out in my mind so clearly that I've decided to dedicate a separate section of the video to it. It could theoretically exist independent from the catacombs, but I also thought it would fit really well as an easter egg area. Before I get to that one however, I'd like to talk about one more concept for a full biome. Strap in, because this next one is rather stunning.
Magnetite is a resource found in both Subnautica and Subnautica Below Zero. The PDA entry in both games describes the item as an iron oxide valued for its magnetic potential amongst other qualities that is used in many Federation technologies including sonar and torpedo systems. As I was thinking about this resource, I had an idea. Biomes are often themed around a defining physical characteristic. Unlike biomes such as the kelp forest or the bulb zone where their name comes from the dominant flora in the region, some areas are named for a universal physical attribute. The lava zone and crystal caves are two key examples. When thinking about how this could extend to concepts for new biomes, I originally considered an acid zone dominated by acid waterfalls that would spill outwards from cracks in the walls, but the idea ended up being too similar to the brine pools of the Lost River. Eventually, I settled on a magnetic themed biome that would be known as the Magnetic Fields. A powerful magnetic force would permeate the water of the magnetic field's biome. This strong, irregular force would be caused by the seafloor being composed of almost entirely iron alloys that are high in aluminum, nickel, and cobalt. These compounds are often called alnico alloys and can produce strong natural magnets. This biome would be great for finding titanium and copper as well, because those elements are also commonly found in alnico alloys. Alone, all of these natural magnets would not produce their own magnetic fields, but they could be induced to do so in the presence of an electrical current. Thankfully, Subnautica has already given us a solution for how that could occur. Ampules and crab squids have already been shown manipulating electricity to a strong degree, so if enough similar creatures entered the region, the rock formations would quickly become magnetized. All these magnetic fields crossing over each other would create unpredictable forces, pockets of attraction and repulsion, and would generally serve to disrupt the player. One such effect would be the rocks in the region randomly flying around and crashing together, damaging or even killing the player. This idea reminds me of the Cyanian rock concept art from the early days of Subnautica, and something similar could feature in this biome. As the player would try to pass through two cliff faces, they would begin to slide together, crushing the player if they didn't get away quick enough. The biome would also have strong currents that could serve to push the player towards danger or repel them from areas of importance. Some spaces would even be entirely electrified, meaning you would have to avoid exploring them without proper protection. Essentially, this biome would be very difficult to explore, which is why it would be a late game biome. As if all that wasn't bad enough, the magnetic fields would also interfere with your tools, equipment, and vehicles. All electronics would cease to function in this biome, including submersibles. Of course, there would be a warning voice line before entering the biome to prevent players from unfairly losing their vehicles. As another warning, vehicles would take damage before being destroyed completely, to give the player a chance to react and escape. There are a couple of options for how the idea of disabled electronics would work. The first option is that later on in the game, upgrades that allow vehicles to traverse the biome would become available to craft. Some or all tools and pieces of equipment could also be upgraded in order to be used as well. The second option is that there would simply be no upgrades to allow vehicles to work, which would force the player to explore this biome without any vehicles protecting them. The entire idea of this option would be to combat how overpowered vehicles can be. Like as soon as I get the prawn suit in Subnautica, I'm essentially unkillable. But this option still seems kind of lame, so I definitely prefer the first option where the player would need certain upgrades to allow vehicles to withstand the magnetic fields. I feel like the dangers posed by the biome would already make it difficult enough for the player to need to survive without any vehicles. The third option, however, is much more exciting than any of the previous ideas. Similarly to the Snow Fox, the only vehicle that would function inside of the magnetic fields would be a low-protection, high-mobility glider designed to evade the dangers of the rocks and resist the strong currents. Due to being built for speed above all, this vehicle would be called the Marlin. This is an acronym, like PRON, that stands for Magnetic Attraction and Repulsion Lead Insulated Nanospeeder. The player would still have to be alert, as the Marlin would have about as much health as the Snow Fox in an extremely dangerous biome. Along with the Marlin, there would also be several new tools which would still function inside of the magnetic fields. These specialized tools would work for navigation and other particular functions, while all other tools would not work, presenting another unique challenge. For example, one piece of equipment could protect the player from the electrified zones of the biome. Any of these three options could be selected by the developers, or they could even try to combine them in a number of ways. Since this biome would be encountered late in the game, I imagine there would be certain unique resources found within the biome that would be essential to collect in order to beat the game. I would also imagine that the flora and fauna would be unique to the biome, as they would have to be adapted to the harsh pressures of this environment. The fauna would be able to manipulate the magnetic fields to their advantage, utilizing them to find prey and to traverse the biome quickly. 
Certain flora would also use the flying rocks of the biome to travel around, much like how sea anemones attach to crabs' backs, in order to get a free ride. The player would also be able to manipulate the field to their advantage, using marlin upgrades or some of the previously mentioned tools to do so. A lot of the creatures in the biome would be electric themed, and would have electric abilities, similar to the aforementioned ampule in crab squid, but applied in different ways. Can you imagine what it must feel like for creatures to get hit with a stasis rifle? Well, now you would be able to, thanks to the Stun Slug, a large, soft-bodied gastropod that would send out a bolt of stunning electricity at anything that gets too close. Electricity and magnetism are so versatile that it's hard to imagine all the ways they could be implemented as special abilities for creatures. Aesthetically, the biome would be mostly grey in color, with perhaps some hints of yellow and blue. I feel like a mostly grey terrain that would look a lot like magnetite with yellowish fog would look really cool. There could also be caves connected to this biome, with similar unique magnetic properties. Overall, this biome just really seems Subnautica-esque. Exploring it would present a frustrating yet rewarding challenge to overcome. It opens the door for a ton of new mechanics, tools, equipment, and submersibles designed to maneuver this tricky biome. There are so many options that, as with all the concepts in this video, if you have any additions you think would make these biomes more interesting, let me know in the comment section down below. The fourth and final biome idea I have would be called the Emerald Isle. Yes, that is a real place, I know, but keep in mind that these names are subject to change. The Emerald Isle could be an entire biome, but I feel like it would fit better as a mini biome. This is the easter egg concept I mentioned earlier when discussing the catacombs biome that I felt was so special it deserved its own section. Furthermore, it wouldn't necessarily need to be attached to the catacombs, as it could be attached to any cavernous biome. This biome is essentially a pocket of air inside of an underwater cave system. We've seen something similar to this in previous Subnautica games with precursor caches, but it's plausible that something like this could form naturally. All it would take is a naturally formed land cave, with a very specific structure similar to an upside down U, to eventually become overtaken by the ocean. Due to that cave's structure, an air bubble at the very top would remain trapped, even after the rest of the cave flooded. And because the cave walls would be composed of a very solid material, the air would be unable to escape, resulting in the air bubble being permanent. If there were organisms living within the cave at the time it was flooded, or even just algae, the air could remain breathable, which would ultimately result in the Emerald Isle. To enter the biome, you would need to travel directly up from the cave system below. There would be a few stray emerald-like rocks at the entrance, hinting that there would be something special up above. As you travel upwards, the crystals would increase in size and frequency. These crystals would be similar to the large emeralds you can find in Subnautica Below Zero. While bearing greater similarity to ion cubes, they wouldn't be artificial. You would also begin to notice an increasing number of flora and fauna as you travel upwards, whereas the rest of the cave system below you had been relatively sparse. Eventually, after traveling up for some time, you would reach the air bubble. There would be a beach surrounding you on all sides, densely packed with beautiful tree-like flora. The emerald crystals would pack the walls and the ceiling, emitting a glow that would illuminate the entire area. Among the dangerous ocean depths, this place would be an absolute oasis. The whole area would feel tropical even though the sun wouldn't shine down here. The flora and fauna of the Emerald Isle would be modeled after tropical shoreline organisms. Alien variants of palm trees, coconut crabs, sea turtles, and the like would populate this green paradise. A side aspect of the story, not essential to completing the game, might also be found here. Regardless, this place would be stunning, and would be an extremely rewarding find if it was located in the catacombs. Now that I think about it, it would also make the perfect spot for a base. Let me know in the comment section down below if you have any ideas for Subnautica 3 biomes, or if you have anything that you think should be added to any of these biomes. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.